Welcome to the Adventures of Alice and Bob, the podcast that shines a light on the people working the front lines of cybersecurity, where we find out what motivates them, hear a few of their amazing stories that have shaped their careers, and hopefully all learn a thing or two along the way. Today, I'm super excited to introduce you to Scott Behrens, a principal security engineer at Netflix. I'm going to kick things straight off by asking Scott, how do you even introduce yourself at a dinner party? Dan, well, thanks for having me, Carl. That's a really great question. Usually my intro is, I work in security. I don't know how to fix your printer. And <laughs> uh, at one point in time, I did physically break into a large hedge fund uh, to simulate a physical security breach. And I usually pause there because it's a great story to share with folks. Although my role today is much different. I am no longer lock picking and, and entering physical facilities and instead I, you know, I work security at Netflix and I really try to help the organization manage security risk while enabling productivity and efficiency for the business. I, I care deeply about both the security pieces as well as making the business run fast and smooth and productive. Uh, I care deeply about that. So, I mean, I'd be a terrible podcast host if I didn't ask about breaking into an organization. Um, I, I guess it would lead into one of the questions I always ask is, you know, where, when did that interest spark for you for security and kind of what, what led you to the point you were lock picking a door to break into a hedge fund? Yeah, great question. Um, I got involved in computers pretty early in life. We had a, oh my gosh, a gateway 233 megahertz PC. I had installed some software on it and I was able to take a class in high school, a programming course. And so we had the, the PC at home. I was able to take a programming course and was lucky enough to get selected to take a course at the Vry University Visual Basic Programming course. It was interesting to me because I did terrible. I was really not good at programming. I, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was this, the, the setup of the school environment, but it was really hard for me to, uh, to, to feel like I was really learning anything, but I was interested in it. I just didn't, for whatever reason, it was, that was not the right presentation of the context for me. You know, fast forward a few more years, I'm, still taking uh, courses and I, I get a job at a bank and I'm working as a teller and I see on the internal jobs board a, a, a position for a PC technician. And I was like, well, I kind of know how to fix computers. I'll, I'll, I'll apply. And I, I actually ended up getting the job. Ended up working uh, alongside Michael Ortega, who helped organize the Chicago B-Sides conference, which is super interesting because we were both very young in our career. He was kind of my mentor at the time and you know, fixing printers and, and computers and stuff like that. Um, and, and that's kind of how, how things started on, on the technology side. I got into college and was able to land a co-op position at Argonne National Laboratories. And at that time, I really sort of solidified myself as I really like network and systems administration. So I kind of went all in on that. And that's what I was doing at Argonne. I left Argonne to work for the Electronic Visualization Laboratory, which for some time I was kind of doing the same thing, a lot of networking and, and system stuff, a little bit of scripting here and there. I enjoyed that a lot more when I was doing it on the job as opposed to in school. And then as I started to go through my master's degree at, at college, I had gone into consulting. I was still doing um, network and services administration. But when I, when I got into my master's degree, I took more focus on security courses. And I had this really awesome course called Software Security Assessment. It was kind of like near the end of my, my journey there. And I kind of got, got to learn how to hack. You know, they were teaching you web vulnerabilities and, and compiled code vulnerabilities. And I got the right shell code. I was so passionate for it that I kept telling the professors, like, I love this. How do I get into this field? And they're like, well, we both work for Neohapsis, which was a small boutique consulting firm in Chicago. They're like, you should apply. We don't generally hire brand new people, but you really have a passion and an interest in this. So I applied. Uh, I took a gigantic salary cut from what I was making in consulting, uh, but was able to get my foot in the door as an associate security consultant at Neohapsis. Um, the, the two folks I must give a shout out to that were uh, teaching that course were Greg Ose and Patrick Toomey, both great security leaders at GitHub, and they're still there today. Uh, they were really pivotal in sort of bringing me into the field and helping mentor me when I got on the job. And so as an associate security consultant, I was just kind of soaking in all the information. I was so happy to have gotten 
into that field. And, you know, over time, I just continued to sort of develop that skill set. Uh, as my career progressed at Neohapsis, I was promoted to a security engineer, then a, a senior security engineer. And I got to a point where um, our physical security team in practice kind of needed more support. So I was like, oh, yeah, physical security. That sounds like something I'd be really interested to do. Um, and of course, I raised my hand. I'm like, I'm very interested to join and, and be part of the physical security team on, on top of what I was mostly doing, which was application security assessments. And so one of our clients, to bring this full circle, was a large hedge fund. And we were sort of tasked with two objectives. Um, compromise intellectual property and get within a particular distance of a particular key personnel. So we needed to establish a proximity to the, to, those were our, our targets for the engagement. Um, and we, uh, it was, I was super excited. It was my first time kind of doing this work. Uh, we built all sorts of, of pretext and implements to help us with this assessment that none of them worked. We, uh, we had, we, we made fake badges. We, uh, you know, we had a pretext that we were like from, that we were going to bring art into the building, that we were from a local school and we needed a tour of the building that didn't work. And ultimately, um, I kind of realized, wow, we're not going to get in the building. And then at night, uh, we lick lock picked the shed, uh, in the, in, in the, on the building facility, we climbed in through an open window that wasn't closed. And I was able to find the IT help desk and achieve one of the two objectives before I was caught by security. Um, it was interesting because when I tell this story, I have a like a deep feeling of like satisfaction and joy. But the entire event was nerve wracking and awful. Like I was sweating the whole time. I was so nervous. I was like, why did I get myself into this field? Um, but then I remembered that, you know, the benefit of that is I was able to identify some particular weaknesses for that, that organization and they were able to put mitigations in place and that was deeply rewarding. <laughs> so that's really cool. That is really cool. Especially in the physical space. Cause you see the impact like immediately in front of your eyes, right? Like Absolutely. The windows are now closed and locked. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> exactly. Sort of fast forwarding now into your current role, principal security engineer, very much a a unique role in an organization, let alone an organization that's a studio, a streaming company, a games company, and much more. How, how did you get into that area? And can you kind of walk us through a bit of a typical day for you in your role now? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll cover both of those. So to get into my role, I started as an application security engineer at Netflix really early. We were just getting the streaming service started, and I was uh, really kind of brought in to help build out application security discipline and practice at the organization. It looked a lot different then, or at least I, I thought it would be kind of what I was doing at Neohapsis. I'll come in, I'll break some applications, we'll file some reports. It doesn't scale when you have thousands of applications. It doesn't scale when the company's moving at, at breakneck pace. And so I had to really switch my approach and started writing some tooling to help me with assessments and then went back to assessments and realized that's not working. Maybe we need to form deeper partnerships with these teams. And so we formed a partnership component. And I was working the partnerships with the organization, was getting much more traction on getting better security um, designs in their systems and, and vulnerabilities remediated. Switched back to engineering, and I kind of just did this trade back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at some point, I started to see that there was a lot of problems that were really not cleanly cut in a team's charter or really required a lot of teams to sort of organize and, and tackle it. And I started to pick up those types of problems and work on them. Um, I was still on an engineering team at the time. I, I'd actually moved full time into a software engineering team, but was definitely not contributing as much directly as the rest of the team was because I was mostly working cross-functionally. And at that point, they moved me into a, a different position where I was reporting to our director with a slightly broader scope where I was able to kind of do that work with a, with a little bit more agency and autonomy. And now you fast forward today, where I report to our CISO, uh, Vitaly, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of working at this intersection of our information security program, our privacy engineering program, and our governance risk and compliance program. Because there's actually a lot of intersections between all three of those things if you look at it. So, you know, a typical day day for me now in my in my current role is really sort of, I kind of focus on a few different areas. I work really hard to get us work plans and strategies that can solve problems for the organization. And I mostly do that cross-functionally. So I'll bring people together and say, you know, how do you, 
measure everything in cybersecurity or what would it look like if we wanted to manage more access for our users across the organization and kind of come in with a problem statement and work to really develop that that technical strategy, the how we would actually do it. We take that strategy to the engineering roadmap or to the professional services roadmaps and we get the work done. And so I spend a fair bit of time sort of developing those cross-functional strategies. But to do that, I spend even more time reading, uh, understanding business context and direction. Um, I spend a lot of time reading other teams' uh, plans and visions and, um, and, and strategies because really I want our security and privacy functions to be enablers for the organization. And so I spend a fair bit of time really trying to get all that business context which is like maybe half of my time to then work on developing those strategies, building the prototypes uh, to solve those types of problems. And so my day to day is, is, is a, is a fair bit different than it was seven or eight years ago where I was, you know, had burp suite open and I'm like pen testing apps all day uh, to today where, um, you know, I've been writing a lot of code, but that's very atypical. Like I might not write code for a month until I, until I need to tell a better story or until I need to pull data. Or until I need to, you know, prototype a particular solution for a problem that I can convince an organization that might not own that problem to go solve. Um, and so I find that it's uh, it's a really fun, challenging job. The payoffs are much further in the future. As in, it used to be I would submit a pull request and I'm like, yeah, I got the feature done. And now it's like, okay, a quarter and a quarter and I get some little signals and I'm on the right path. But oh. I'm on the wrong path. I got to pivot. So uh, you find different ways to reward yourself for uh, the ambiguity of the work that you're trying to drive as a security principal engineer. That sounds really cool. And something I picked up on right at the start of that actually was you said you had to create some tools to support the sort of rocket ship growth of Netflix and be able to scale your your ability within the organization. Yeah. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the types of tools you had to pull together? Yeah, and they're actually a lot of these tools have gone through several evolutions or complete rewrites, and they're still a huge part of our strategy today. Um, this will probably come to no surprise for your listeners, but asset inventory continues to be the the big the big open ended problem for at scale companies. How do you manage all of the various assets you have? And so one of our first projects was really working on asset inventory systems. Now, when we started at Netflix and we started to do this stuff. We uh, we spent a fair bit of time on scanning all of our assets. So we would we would leverage things like Arachni Web Scanner or excuse me um, the and a map scan stuff like that because we were just trying to get a, a sense of what was going on. But uh, th those challenges actually or that approach didn't work super well for us because. When you're scanning again thousands of applications and you're like here's the reports back and you're like 35,000 findings you're like that can't be right uh, how am i going to actually prioritize that so we really shifted our strategy for asset inventory management from like scanning and, and, and sort of you could say almost first party vulnerability identification and with a little bit of third party stuff to much more into how, how we work on asset inventory today and how we've evolved that product is more on security assurance. It's like, do they have the right security primitives present? Not like, do they have a, uh, uh, like an IDOR uh, vulnerability or something like that. Instead, we wanna say, well, okay, maybe they have an IDOR vulnerability. Sure, that's kind of hard to find sometimes, depends on the scanner, but can we confirm that the authorization is configured correctly, that the policy looks good, that it's enforcing it in the right access points? And so, you know, my belief and sort of the strategy that we've leveraged in that type of tooling is like focus more on assurance than just on vulnerability identification. Now, they're both important, but when you're in a polyglot environment with like a bunch of different types of programming languages and frameworks, it's a lot easier for us to assert correctness than it is to identify vulnerability. And so that's been a big guiding practice for some of our tooling and design, uh, like the asset inventory product that we worked on. Yeah. That's awesome. And I I remember you mentioning just at the kind of start of our discussions together that one of the things you're you're working on is prioritization. Now, this is something I've always struggled with in my career. I'm sure many of our listeners have struggled within our within our careers too. Um, sounds really simple, but rarely is, right? Like, how do I know what to work on now to to kind of minimize risk or tackle the biggest challenge? 
What, what's been your approach to doing this? Yeah. And, you know, just, just to sort of like, let, let all the listeners know, this has been my main project and focus for about the last year. And I think realistically, probably my focus for the rest of the, of the year is really thinking about how do we sort of have a good enough understanding of our risk, threats, vulnerabilities, and, and control posture to say, these are the risks that we're actually going to go after. Um, we work very closely with our enterprise risk partners in the organization, but you know they operate um, at a much higher sort of level in the organization. The risk assessments that they provide the organization really serve an executive leadership audience, but managers that are maybe working on endpoint security and managers that are maybe working on product security, uh, you know that context isn't quite as helpful as say, ah, we actually think you know for that specific risk, let's say it's like payment data compromise, if we can actually sort of understand like, what are the ways that attackers achieve that in, in, our, in our environment, and do we have the right controls in, that are present for those types of attacks? Um, if, we, if we don't have the right controls or the controls are insufficient, is that where we should go? Uh, that's the type of context I'm trying to provide. I like to describe, I've, I've gone a layer lower than enterprise risk does. And I'm really trying to decompose those risks into the tactics and the techniques that adversaries use to achieve them. And, um, you know, my goal is with this project and how I believe this is going to help work prioritization is when we take that sort of an approach, we bring assessors into a room and we start looking at the ways that our risks happen in our environment. You might in your head think like attack graph and the answer is yes, kind of a little bit like that. Um, but we want to bring that together with threat intelligence information and incident information and our quantified risk assessments. And so I look at this intersection of like four things. How good is our control posture? What is our forecasted risk? Or what do we think is going to happen when the black swan event happens? How big is it going to be? How frequently is it going to be? Um, actualized risk, which is like incidents, bug bounty, you know, the things that actually happen that cost the business money. And so I, I think that that sort of intersection of control posture, actualized risk and forecasted risk, I think that that brings us a lot of insight to actually set risk priorities. Um, and that's the approach that I'm trying to bring together for the organization. It seems to be working pretty well where we get resistance from people who are receiving the context is, well, this isn't everything, you know, this isn't, you didn't go all the way down. You didn't look at all the procedures. And, and the answer is that I find, you know, and this is a recommendation I'll just share. This has been my perspective is you really only need to get enough context to feel marginally more confident that you're making the right decision. Like you don't need to be perfect. We all have a lot of risk and vulnerability we're managing. And so if you pick the one that's like a million dollars, the one that's like $900,000, if you're operating at scale, it's probably not that big of a deal, but would be a worse deal is if it took you six or eight or nine months to make a decision. Because at that point, all that additional time of having those vulnerabilities exposed are much, much likely more costly than you just Picking the thing that might be up, you know, the, the second or third in the stacked rank list, right? That, that's awesome advice, and thank you so much for that. Seems uh, a lot, a lot more complex than just risk is threat times <laughs> vulnerability. Yes, a lot, a yes, lot going yeah. on there, <laughs> particularly across all those different business units and capabilities as well. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of in a little bit of a reverse order. I was going back thinking, I do wonder if our some of our listeners understand what application security testing is. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm aware of static integrated dynamic testing. I was just wondering if you could give us a bit of a primer on that in case you haven't heard those topics before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we've done it historically at Netflix. Uh, you know, when I started a lot of my application security work, I like to call it sort of manual gray box testing. I have source code available to me. I have a dynamic running environment and I'm testing for common vulnerabilities, uh, uh, CWE top 25, OWASP top 10, and I'm looking for and then unique particular sort of vulnerabilities and code practices in Netflix. And I'm, I'm doing that dynamic testing live. I have a proxy. I use a tool called Burp Suite, and that inter is intercepting the traffic between my browser as a client and the API or the server on the other side. And I'm sort of performing assessments that way. Parts of our other strategy early in our in the Netflix sort of security SDLC was a dynamic scanning, which you can kind of think of as I'm pointing a tool at the web application and it is going to 
look, it's going to try to run a bunch of the security tests I'm doing manually, but with uh, a little bit less of the human touch. So it'll, it'll kind of brute force and try various, various things. And if, if the signatures pick up correctly, it'll report those as findings. You know, in, in our experience, the dynamic scanners, uh, historically, and even still today have been a little bit false positive. I think part of that is just the level of complexity of our products and the fact that they they require uh, a fair bit of like rendering in the client. It, it, they're challenging for our scanners uh, to be valid. So we've we've sort of limited our our focus on um, dynamic scanning to mostly scanning, as you mentioned, sort of static analysis. We spend a fair bit of time looking for vulnerable third party code. Supply chain is is very it's top of mind for a lot of folks. And, you know, in our environment, because we have folks using libraries and dependencies from a lot for a lot of different languages, we spend a lot of time making sure that they can do that safely. And so on the AppSec side, we we work really hard to make sure that our our applications are using high quality third party vulner or third party plugins that are free of vulnerabilities. And we have tooling and automation we've built to really help us with that at scale. So if a particular thing like log4j happens, we can kind of go around and actually identify what applications have that package and develop an incident response plan for them. So that's worked really well for us. But I think in summary, that's those are some of the components of AppSec for us. That There are other technologies uh, that we could get into that I'm aware of, but we don't use a Netflix like runtime application, security protection, and other technologies. But I think for your listeners, the important parts are kind of that intersection of manual testing or sort of automated testing. And, and we've kind of done a mix of both, but have, have generally focused mostly on third party to tackle the supply chain issues. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I hadn't even considered the, uh, the impact of having so much rendering on the client side that it might break some of the vulnerability assessment tools as well. That's yeah, quite an interesting consideration you have to work around. Yeah, pretty awesome. Um, you mentioned log4j, I think probably a good segue for me to ask you about <clears throat> what's it like being on call for every incident ever? You know, if it gets that bad, they're picking up the phone to you, right, Scott? <laughs> I mean, I think it's a great way to put it is that when, when you have an, a fleet wide incident, um, really anybody with incident response tools and experience and practices should, should be involved. Um, now I'll, I'll caution that to say that, um, you have too many cooks in a kitchen, you could potentially slow things down. So I'll be very cautious to say to, for your listeners to say like it work with your incident commanders, obviously, if you think you're the right kind of person to help out with the task. And, um, you know, it with, when log for J happened, I'll sort of give a little bit of a background. I had organized a security hack day. I got folks all over the organization for a one day hack day. It started in the morning of log for J. We didn't know, right? Of course. And it was exciting. Folks flew in. We were all working on different projects. Some folks were working on vulnerability discovery. Some were working on cool tooling. It was a lot of fun. We had pizzas and everything. Like right around as the night was kind of going on and we started to get news of the log4j, I, I went home. I just like any normal night, I went to bed. And I woke up in the morning and was like, why, why do I have 150 unread Slack messages? Like I've never seen that before, you know? And I started to dig in and we realized that the sort of the incident was was kicking off uh so we quickly stopped our our hack day we never sent the awards i still have them in the box in the back of my studio but we uh yeah we were all hands on deck um and you know the first feeling that i had was well this is really intense because we're a java shop <laughs> we use a lot of java um and so you know i think it, it, for me, and, and 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 I had not been on call in a while because I've been in this new role. I rolled off uh, on call in 2020, so it's been three year, you know, two years since I've I've been on call, and I immediately felt all of the same feelings I felt when I was on call responding to an incident. There's this level of passion and excitement that, like, holy cow, I'm on the front lines of this, and then worry, like, what if they actually, f like, what if attackers achieve their objectives? Like, what if we have bad actors now in our environment and we're unable to to contain them or discover their presence and uh, you start to worry about that and and in it, responding to an incident of such a size it shows fractures of your entire security program the little pieces that you didn't quite think about when doing an enterprise wide incident response plan start to 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 pop up and i think one of the things that i learned is like when those surfaced was to manage my my cool, you know, like, oh, 
wow, we really do have to go after this thing, but not right now. Right now, we need to continue moving with our remediation and recovery plan here. Uh, but 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 I don't want to get overwhelmed with the fact that like there are some fractures to deal with. And so I think one of the things that really helped me was just staying focused on the mission and being blameless, right? Because a lot of those trade-offs that we might have made along the way were with good intention. And now that we're doing this big incident response and we see those trade-offs we made or those potential things we didn't document well enough, um, you know, is to to come at come at it from a place of curiosity instead of a, a place from blame, and I, that that helped me manage the incident. I remember working Saturday morning. I'll share this. I was working Saturday morning of of Log for J, and I realized we need to send out enterprise wide communications. And for some reason, they're like, Scott, why don't you go do that? You write a lot of stuff. I was like, Okay, sure, that sounds great. And I'm writing and I'm reading the email, and I got the email. Okay, let me have three more people proofread it. And read read it and they proof it and I send the email and I got the version number wrong on the log4j package. Right. And it's like and my heart just drops. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I just I just interrupted so many thousands of people's time to read this thing and they the the version number wasn't right. So I had to quickly like send an amendment out. And I was like, oh my gosh. But one of the things that you have to sort of be uh, that I find um, helps me w when being on incident is like being okay, making mistakes. It's really hard to work under duress. You have to give yourself a little bit of forgiveness. If you typo an email that you send company wide in the middle of an incident that you've been working for 16 hours straight, you know, did you find it hard to sort of look after yourself when you were doing the incident response, like having a break, stepping away, collecting your thoughts? Yeah. And actually I, like I would ask teams, like, have have you taken a break? Or I'd ask like IR folks, like, have you taken a break today? Have you drank what we would do the water thing? Like, are you drinking water? Because when you're if you're the kind of person who can really get into the hyper focus during an incident, it's like all time stops. All you were thinking about is that incident. You might not drink any water. You might not take a lunch break. Um, and then I worry that uh, being in that sort of state of mind for too long, I always worry about like the quality of my decision making. Um, you know, because I feel like I'm able to be on for a while and be quite effective. But uh, days of, of you know, your Saturday, you work, you're working an eight or a nine or a ten or eleven hour day. Then you're getting up Sunday, and you've already worked a full work week, and so you're hitting your next eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hour day. I just worry a little bit about the quality of my decisions, and so I tried to prioritize breaks. One of the ways that we were able to manage that in Netflix is we were pretty diligent about pulling people in and out. We knew who was working what particular tracks for the incident. We had backups. We had rotations in place. And we really worked hard to make sure that the team could sustain. But it was difficult. Uh, I found myself forgetting water for a full day and then like laying in bed at night and like thinking about like, okay, I'm working on the script to get all the ownership information for the applications. It should look this way. I bet you if I, if I work here, it's like, I couldn't shut my brain off, you know? So I'm laying in bed, can't wait to get up, but also like exhausted, you know? Yeah, I actually need to sleep at some point to write this script. <laughs> exactly. Oh, sort of last question on that. Did you find you prioritized other people's care over yours? So we're like, have you had water today, but didn't think about yourself? Have you had a break? Didn't think about yourself? Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things definitely that I have a tendency to do is, uh, yeah, think more about others than myself. I'm like, I can take it. You know, I'll, I'm happy to wake up on Saturday at five in the morning so you can get sleep. Um, and, w you know, one of the reasons I felt like I was able to do that, though, is like I had, you know, the privilege of not being on call. I, I was not on call for my general day to day. And I had worked, I've been incident commander on so many critical incidents, really big incidents throughout Netflix's history and the industry's history, like shell shock and heart bleed. I worked those incidents. I was IC on or incident commander on both of those incidents. Um, those incidents were long, so I wasn't the only informed or incident um, commander, but you know, I had all that experience. And, and so for me, it, it, it felt, it was hard. Uh, but I, I, I knew that I could step in and, and really help out and give a break for the team and just take a little bit because I was, I'm not on call all the time. And I know that, you know, for some of our incident responders, they are getting paged in the middle of the night. The incidents might not be as large as log for j but they're still, you know, responsible for that. And I just wanted to help. And so I did. Yeah. And thank you for helping. Right. I think, uh, 
making the world a better place. Sometimes you don't really don't really understand the impact you have until you go through incidents. I think is is kind of my experience. Um, <clears throat> just just on the last note, there I was I was going to ask if you had any kind of further advice for for people in those IR kind of roles to to find that calm in the chaos. You know, are there things that helped you? I, I think the the focus on curiosity, um, and and really not like seeing the incident as as there's generally not a root cause for an incident. Like, oh, there's this one root cause, there's this one thing that happened, or this one misconfiguration, this one thing, but it's it's actually a lot. There's a lot of systems at place. And I think one of the things that I would recommend to incident responsors is to take that and say it's really not a root cause, it's a collection of of events and, and decisions and what have that sort of lead to that. That makes it a lot easier to be blameless. And I find that you know, coming at it from a place of curiosity and think about what are the systems or decisions that sort of all culminated to this point. Um, I found that that's been helpful for me to sort of rationalize how I might be feeling in the middle of an incident, which is like, wow, oh, this is really frustrating. Uh, and I rewind and say, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why we're here. And, um, and a lot of those reasons are probably good reasons, weirdly, but, but that's true. And another thing I would recommend to my incident response, uh, folks is, um, pass for help. You know, I think um, think one thing I've I've seen is, hey, I'm I'm the I, I'm the commander, or I'm sort of leading this big focus. Like, I'm just going to take it all on. Um, you know, one of the things I find about information security professionals is how much we like helping others. You start asking folks, hey, I need a hand writing this script, or can you help me sort of dig into this area over here? I'm not sure that I that this vulnerability is really high. I think it might be critical. Can you help me see if we can find a variant that would take it to critical? Like if anybody asked me any of those questions, even in my role now, I'd be like, yes, I'm, I'm here to help. I can't wait to help you. And so I would say, ask for help when you, when you need it and ask for help when you need a break. Um, I think you'd be surprised. Your team will probably give it to you. That's some fantastic advice. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was going to move from the reactive, the being on the edge of an incident to the, the proactive. And I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about the, uh, I guess, a vulnerability assessment you, you performed. Um, where you simulated a distributed denial of service attack for, is it $2? $2, that's right. Yeah, let's dig into it. So a handful of years ago, I started to look at application denial of service vulnerabilities in our streaming product. And th where this all started was we, we had an outage. We had an outage. The some of our middle tier and back end services went out because of a misconfigured client. And I was like, how does a misconfigured client, like think of like a Samsung TV or something was misconfigured. I was like, how does that actually take, how does that like cause an outage? And as I started to dig into the incident, I was like, oh, this is really interesting. The client is asking for a ridiculous amount of information from our services. And it's like, and it's a bug. It effectively, instead of saying, hey, I want 10 shows, I want to, you know, I want, your whole catalog is kind of summarizing what it was sort of doing. And I was like, that's sort of interesting. And I started to look at sort of the client calls happening in the product uh, when I would open up my browser and sort of click around and, and stream. And I saw a couple calls that seemed to take, I don't know, a second and a half or two to complete. I was like, well, those calls seem interesting. What do they look like? And they were graph style calls. And so for your listeners, you can sort of think of that as like, we had had a, a gateway kind of graph product at the edge that you could sort of put a bunch of things you wanted in about a particular show as an example, and it would return return that context to you. Um, but what was happening behind the scenes as I started to dig in and at, at those calls that were kind of latent was um, I would say, hey, I want, you know, give me all the bookmarks for my for the shows I've watched in the last two months. And it would, uh, it had this little structure and it was like zero to 10. You know, I could see it. Bookmarks, 0 to 10. Okay, 100. Oh, the, the call took an extra 5 seconds. Okay, 200, 300. Oh, 417, request entity too large. Okay, so I guess it can't return that. Let's go, let's find the sweetest spot that we can. Those calls were taking about 8 or 10 or 12 seconds, and I, I started to then explore our graph primitives at the edge and, and look for what are ways that I can increase the total number of objects that I'm requesting from the back end. And what was interesting is I started to see that some of the those particular requests were fanning. So I would send one payload, give me a thousand of this object. And then when it hit the gateway, the gateway's like, okay, I'll make a thousand calls, you know, because it was sort of misconfigured in a certain way. 
And what ended up happening was is, is gateways uh, in an in a API gateway microservice architecture, there's this thing called like circuit breakers and client back off. So if the API is sitting there and it's making all these requests and eventually that backend backend service starts to get slow, it's like something's not right with the backend service. We got to break the circuit. And we'll 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 just we'll return some fallback or some like you know we'll, we're we're going to resolve this issue soon kind of an error message. So I started triggering all the breakers as I'm sending like one request, and if I do this enough, the API gateway thinks all the middle tier and backend services are unhealthy, and it starts to roll the fleet. What does that mean? It means it starts to actually bring up new services. And so as I'm sort of building out these various attacks, all sort of focused on this. We decided, I think that there's enough of a vulnerability here to like actually do a full blown test. I was poking at like some test environment, dev environment that was really small, not at scale. Now at Netflix, we run these exercises where we'll, from a business continuity perspective, we'll evacuate an entire region of AWS. So you can think of the region as like the data center where our services are. And we'll do that. We do that a lot. And we make sure that our environment can, can operate if regions or multiple regions fail. So what I did is I waited until we had evacuated one of our largest regions. And then I worked with another engineer, Jeremy Hefner. Uh, we, um, we spun up about 10 EC2 applications that were sending about 200 requests. Well, it wasn't 200. It was less than that. It was about 10 applications sending about 200 requests per second. If you imagine Netflix, you know we're getting a lot more than, than 2,000 requests per second. We're getting a ton. Um, and as, as, as that region was evacuated, what was interesting is you have a fully saturated environment, meaning it is running as if we had a full customer base, but we had no customers. And I start launching the attack. We st we're seeing the requests come in. I start seeing some of the 415s, the 502s, and it's like the circuit's not healthy and it starts cutting the circuits for the backend services. And I get to a point where when you try to go to Netflix.com in that specific region, the site is completely offline. Um, and what was really exciting about it was I did that attack in a fully evacuated region. If it would have been with customers, I probably could have sent 20% of the load that I did because it would have been existing load on those services. Uh, and it was so exciting because when we completed the test, we were able to mitigate all of this risk. Like we had a, we, we, we developed such a quality mitigation plan that is still put into place today where you can't application denial service vulnerability now. Our clients no longer make single requests. Everything is batched. We have firewalls between all of our services, whether it's at the edge or the middle tier or the back ends. We check for path depth and path uh, expansion attacks and, and the client side. And so we have a really robust mitigation strategy that I'm super proud of because uh, you know, when I was kind of poking at this, I had no idea that this is where it was going to lead. Uh, but it was a ton of fun, a really great learning experience as a security professional. And I'm just really grateful that we've now mitigated that risk and, and made Netflix more secure. So that sounds absolutely incredible. I'm just, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think what, what was it like when you presented that to the senior leadership team and Hey, by the way, this happened. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the interesting things was getting buy-in. I mean, effectively, I was saying, hey, I'm going to run a denial of service attack against our live product. Um, so I spent a fair bit of time really working with leaders on, I wanted to make sure that this, that, that our assumptions were true because I knew mm. that the mitigation for this project was going to be time. We were going to have to do a bunch of stuff to mitigate this risk. And so I tried to really approach it from a place of, this is really about embracing the curiosity part, which is one of our Netflix cultural tenants, and try to bring it back to more of the business need. Hey, our streaming product, we have a particular goal for SLA, how it's reliability. And I what I did is I folded the narrative of the work into more of the broader business objectives, like keeping the product running, keeping our customers able to enjoy watching Netflix. And by bringing in the business perspective and saying that this is a strategy to help us do that better, uh, that really worked for my target audience. And that's something I do a lot today, still in my career. That was much earlier, but a, a lot of my work today is really figuring out how security is an enabler of the business and telling those stories well. Uh, that worked well then, and it's worked well for me now. I'm, I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, I, I think it's really cool the way you frame that as 
we're going to help people enjoy Netflix better. We're going to make sure it's still available for them to enjoy their shows. How, I mean, great that you're doing that alongside a project that you want to kind of prove capability. How is an individual contributor in security? Would you recommend or any advice you could give to our listeners about how to get that perspective of the work they're doing in the moment fitting into that bigger picture? Yeah, I think that this is one of the one of the key and it's a great question. It's and it's challenging. One of the things that I've had to prioritize is business understanding and business context. And that's time away from writing an exploit, testing an application, building a prototype, writing some Python code. Um, and so you really need to sort of justify to your leadership why that context matters. Um, you know, I, I remember when I started this, for me, the first thing I read was I read our quarterly business review that it's published, the whole company gets access to it, but it was like 30 pages. I was like, this is intense. I read it and I was like, wow, 90% of this doesn't apply to my job. And then there was this one piece this one particular product or feature that I was like, that's super interesting. I wonder if we can help there. And it was like, I had the aha moment. And I almost would say for folks, um, understanding more about how the business works and how we, the partner teams that you, you work with a lot, how they work and what they care about, it doesn't happen immediately. Meaning like you'll read all that stuff and you might not feel that it fits in or that you can help there. But I don't know, there's this moment where all of a sudden you'll see the, th the through line. I like to describe it. A lot of my job is connecting the dots and mm. I don't always see the dots. I don't always see the lines, but I, I try to look for them. And I and so the kinds of things I think about when I'm reading a particular business goal or objective or a QBR is I'm thinking, what are the ways that this could go wrong? What are the ways that like a threat actor could impact this or a particular security misconfiguration made by a really, you know, a well-intended internal employee? Like what are the growth plans that the organization has and how would security impact growth or how could like a negative security event? And so I try to really think about what I'm getting in that context and how either, you know, a, a motivated actor or a, or a particular security misconfiguration or control or assumption might impact that. And sometimes the lines appear. They don't always, but sometimes they do. And so that my recommendations for your listeners would be to try to spend a little bit more time with that context that, you know, from other teams and, uh, and what have you, and to, and to think about what are their goals and aspirations? What are they trying to drive for the business and how would security, how would that enable it or, or potentially harm them? And, and what could you do to help them achieve their success? I think when we think about security as as this enablement function that kind of works horizontally across a business, I think that that's, in my opinion, that's the best type of program to operate. One that just really helps folks operate safely so that they can do what they're passionate about, you know, which oftentimes if it's another team, it probably isn't security. <laughs> so that, that's, that's a brilliant, brilliant response. And again, loads of incredible kind of pearls of wisdom in there as well. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners will do too. And it got me thinking that we see lots of organizations kind of in the world of continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And I wondered how, how do you feel automation has evolved your role? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think automation is absolutely key. And when we think about build CI CD, I continue to believe that managing more of security for especially let's, we'll talk about the engineering cohort for our engineers. Mm. And I think about them that there's a lot of places where an engineer could potentially, um, excuse me, could potentially introduce a security issue or make a security decision or security impactful decision. And what's interesting is like, it starts in the IDE and you think about all the phases of an SDLC. It's like the IDE to when it's running in production. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about from the automation perspective is I want to get to a position where let's say any engineer can open up their IDE, can start a new application or start writing on an existing application. And as that artifact or that piece of code goes from the IDE all in the production, that I would like more automation and goals to assure that, to really say, ah, as it's hit the build server, the build server is properly locked down. We have the right, we, we know the the, the bill of materials for the packages we're building. We've run the third party code checking, um, sorry, third party vulnerability code scanning stuff. 
it gets to the next phase of the build. Ah, it's baking here. Okay, these properties are involved. And I want to get to this world where when the artifact actually hits production, I have this nice uh, certificate of attestation that tells me these are all the things that we provided from a security perspective. And we did that across every phase of the SDLC. Um, and, and I know um, Google has a, has a fair bit of, of thoughts in this. So they've, in, they've inspired a fair bit of my thinking, but that's definitely the world I'd like to get to. And, and, and I believe that we need to get there. And I think that automation has to be part of the solution. Netflix does hundreds, if not thousands of pull requests and code pushes a week or a day. I, I can't say specifically, but it's too much for any human to look at. We would absolutely um, not be able to be successful as a security organization if we weren't considering automation as part of our strategy for build CI. It's required. Amazing. And I'm going to ask the same question, but with a different hat on. So mm. if you had to put your kind of black hat, red team type, uh, type approach on, ha have you seen threat actors making use of similar automation technologies to kind of operate attacks at scale? Um, yeah, yeah maybe really a great Netflix, question. Just maybe an industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I could probably speak a little bit more to industry than in Netflix specifically, just from a like a confidentiality perspective. But I would say, you know, it wasn't but a couple of weeks ago was I reading a malware form for how our malware writers are using uh, generative AI to pack their my, their binaries or to, to mutate them such that they can bypass things like antivirus. We're already seeing our attackers starting to leverage those types of technologies. And so I think that that's super interesting. Where I see a lot of the the motivation from attackers is from an automation perspective is really on like where they can make money, you know, where they can monetize whatever the particular attack or exploit or weakness that they're looking at. And I often see, um, you know, I think where we where we see the most of that in the Netflix product is, um, you know, where, where we make money, uh, customer accounts and, and, and signups and stuff like that. And we have a, a, a team that's focused on making sure that we're tackling sort of those customer trust, fraud and abuse style attacks at scale. That's a big challenge for us because as you imagine, as you can imagine, when you kind of close down one door, the attacker is still very motivated because there's, it could potentially be their business. And so they mm. go and they look for other potential workarounds and exploits and ways to achieve that fraud. And, and they're often doing this at scale. It's not like one person sitting behind a proxy kind of poking around at the site. They're trying to extremely monetize and 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 abuse the system, and and so, I I think our attackers are using more automation. I think we'll see a higher amount of it, especially um, now that generative just to bring it back to generative AI, not a generate generative AI is available to help you potentially modify your code to to bypass detection. Uh, so I'm ex I'm excited. I'm a little bit worried, but I do think we're going to be at an interesting turning point where we'll see more of these toolings and automations being leveraged for achieving objectives. It'll make us as defenders need to be a little bit more uh, resilient to those types of attacks, and we'll see what they look like. Uh, but I, mm. I think they're coming. Yeah, amazing. And I guess um, it's nice seeing to me me sort of talking and asking questions about where where you go to learn. And I've seen you've mm. been quite a seasoned presenter across various DEF CONs and other security conferences. Um, I was just going to ask you a couple of things around that, really. What, what was great about presenting at those conferences? What did you personally get from sharing that information? And could you offer some advice to our listeners about how to choose somewhere to go and learn? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I you know, one of my sort of personal tenets is to share what I learned and what I know, because that's how I got into the industry and how I've been successful is really learning through others. I And so that's something I care deeply about. And when I think about um, sort of the conferences to to go after or, or to look at, you know, I think there's a couple of things that have sort of changed or evolved my thinking in the last few years. I really try to select conferences that have a high and proven track record of inclusion um, I look for conferences that have a good code of conduct, that have numbers that folks can call if there's particular issues. And so for me, a big focus is on the quality and the safety of the conference. I care mm -hmm. a lot about our underrepresented groups being able to attend those conferences and get a lot of value out of it. And so that's sort of something I spend a lot of time today looking at is, is selecting conferences like that. And 
B-Sides and OWASP are great examples of conferences that really do demonstrate a lot of those qualities and properties. And I think those are great conferences to look at. Um, when I think about, you know, someone who might be hesitant to submit a paper to a conference, maybe mm. they don't feel like they've hit the bar or they're ready. Um, I would say just go for it. And um, you'd be surprised by how um, how compassionate our industry is. You'll get probably pretty meaningful and useful, helpful feedback. Folks are generally kind here. Uh, and it, you have to kind of do one to get the experience. Um, you know, I know for me, when I would, would, would speak at a conference, the thing that I'd be really excited about is just to share. And sometimes uh, maybe the folks listening, it doesn't resonate as much, but, uh, if I can get one person interested in a room of uh, several hundred, I still consider that a win because that might be one person who might then share that context with somebody else and will kind of start a rolling avalanche of context. Um, but I think one of the things I'd recommend is, is just to give it a shot. And you could always start with a conference that's a little bit on a smaller scale than, say, something like Black Hat. B-Sides is a great circuit for, I think, anybody to try to try to go through. And I would encourage your listeners uh, to, to take a look at the B-Side chapter that might be local to where they live as, as a, maybe a first great step. B-Sides loves first-time speakers. And so there's a big supporting community for that. Um, let's get into that really sad time of the podcast where I have to start wrapping up. So I'm into my kind of penultimate questions for you, Scott. Sure. Um, first of all, I mean, you, you've, you've faced a lot in your career in terms of adversary activity, finding vulnerabilities, working through what, what still scares you? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I said it earlier, I'll, I'll say it again. Um, asset inventory inventory is, is interesting. Um, at a nat scale company, we have a lot of investment in it, but I worry a fair bit around particular assets that I just don't have enough context on to provide security or even know what sort of a threat they might have if they compromise in our environment. So, you know, for me, it's I, I have actually a, le a lot less concern about a particular threat actor or an attack. I care a lot more about what I don't know around the systems that we have in our environment. Um, and, and, you know, I'm reminded of the, the Equifax preach, right? Where it was like, I don't know, some old server sort of on the edge that nobody had any inventory on that, that nobody knew anything about. I, I care a lot about those and I'm still worried about that because maybe one other thing I'm a little bit worried about is I think supply chain is, is talked about a fair bit, but I, I, I still worry a fair bit about supply chain. We've done a lot mm. of investments at Netflix that I'm really proud of. I think we have a relatively good story. But I there's just a lot of really interesting attacks you can do from a supply chain perspective. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, if somebody that, you know, if the Node JSON project maintainer leaves GitHub and I claim their repo, you know, like, uh, yeah. then I can put my back door in and anybody can pull it. And... Until that's discovered or identified, like no third party vulnerability scanner is going to uncover that. There's just a lot of those kinds of edge cases that I care deeply about. So I'm worried about supply chain still. Oh, gosh, that must keep you awake at night. I imagine the, uh, the amount of libraries you've called and gosh. Yes. And then my last question, this is a question that's been left for us, left for us by another um, guest on the podcast, which is hmm. what's something you'd like to get better at? Yeah, great question. You know, I think um, I think for me, one thing I'm trying to get better at is when I'm leading a particular project as a technical lead, as a TL, um, how much support do I give the team members, the folks leading their pieces of this so that, um, you know, they can be successful, but also grow? I think it's it's an art to decide how much do you lean into a particular area and say, ah, it looks like you might need a little help. Let me, let me come in and I'll help you build a prototype or we can do this. Or, or, you know, you want to sort of step away so that they have that, that opportunity to grow. I don't think I've identified the sweet spot yet on when to provide a particular sort of cross-functional team, like more support or less support. It's, I think it's an art, but I don't know that like I'm painting Picasso yet. Like I'm still doing stick figures. Like I I'm getting better but I, but I haven't quite mastered that. And, you know, recently in the project that I've been working on, I've been focusing a lot on external engagement with other teams. And then I kind of realized that the internal team 
I had an aha moment where I was like, oh, it looks like the internal team needs more help. I should probably help a little bit more. But I feel like I came to the aha moment like a month too late, meaning like it's fine, but like I was a little bit late on my reaction of like, oh, I need to go back and actually give more support here and less support externally. So for me, I'm just trying to get better at that. I'm trying to get better at like, when do I provide somebody more guidance and support versus sort of removing my presence so that they can grow, learn from failures, all those sorts of things. Um, I care deeply about failure. I think it's really important. Um, and I need to maybe be more comfortable with others failing. I have a lot of comfort with myself, but I think something I could get better at is letting others fail. This has been an incredible episode. I've really enjoyed our discussion. I'm kind of sad, it, sad it's going to finish here, unfortunately. Um, but you know, hopefully one day in the future we'll, we'll get to meet and, and continue these conversations for our listeners and ourselves. Um, Scott, absolutely fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for giving us the time. Um, is there anything else you'd like to get out while we've got the platform for you? Well, you know, I think one thing I'll sort of mention is, um, you know, for your listeners, Netflix is still, we're still hiring. We have security roles open on, and a handful of teams. Um, we, you know, we have really cool problems. So ping, ping me on LinkedIn or, or, or apply for one of our positions. If you're sort of interested in what I've described today as pieces of the types of problems we work on at Netflix, uh, we're, we're working on some really fun stuff. Um, so I'll just sort of let your listeners know that if they're, they find this interesting and would like to come work, work with me, you know, uh, come over and talk to us. We have some pretty cool positions open right now. Amazing. And yeah, certainly a lot of people in the industry affected with needing to find a new role. So a very timely, timely message. Appreciate that, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as, as I say, it's been fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for giving us the time. Um, been an amazing episode and look forward to speaking soon. Thank you, Carl. 